with some of the sewer that they have. Uh, I think partly because there is so much land dedicated to the streets. Um, I'm from the Parkdale Residents Association, so it's very much more local downtown kind of uh, situation. And around me, where I live, is across the street from the Gladstone Hotel. And there's a whole big triangle there. Uh, similar things are happening on Liberty. And what I'm seeing, and I expected it to come, is that densification is moving into Parkdale. So right now there's a proposal for King and Dufferin for very, two very large built, built projects, which I think uh, don't consider their neighborhood. And so I guess what I want to throw back to you is I look at Liberty Village and I look at the triangle and I go the densification there, which is already, especially on, on Queen Street, already has a neighborhood feel and you add that density. Uh, how are you going to do that like on King Street? How do you transform that? You talked about the mid-rise, and I'm looking at high-rises. Yeah. And um, that transformation has to take place some way without losing the neighborhood. And I looked at, I went to the public meeting about those two projects, and they're talking about 5,000 square foot retail. I go, well, mom and pop, forget it. You know, entrepreneurs, they want 1,500 square feet, 1,000 square feet, so they can afford uh, the rents. So, those are some things I'd like your thoughts on. So excellent questions, uh, all difficult ones as well. Um, you didn't have to be easy on me in your work, so that's fine. Um, <laughs> the first thing I'll say about scale is that um, I would be the first to agree there's areas in the city where we haven't gotten the scale right. Um, I think we are struggling with getting the scale right. We have had a tremendous amount of growth very, very quickly. And one of the risks that comes along with that is that you actually make mistakes. You don't have enough time to kind of pause, take stock, reevaluate. You're approving the next project before you even had a chance to understand whether the previous project or a project that is approved but not yet built, what the impact of that project will be. So I think that we have, um, this is why I mentioned the issue around um, the timing. It's something that I'm beginning, I've been here you know, three and a half years now, I'm beginning to kind of feel my land legs around pushing back on the pressure that we feel in the city planning department to be approving things very, very quickly. We're way out ahead of the market. I don't think we should be approving things as quickly as we are. Um, I think that there's a, uh, a, a risk in some instances that the change is happening too quickly and we're not sufficiently evaluating the implications of those changes. And there's, because we have this spiky form in this city, there are areas where um, tall buildings and a lot of density in a very tall form is in fact the most appropriate kind of change that should take place. And then there's other areas of the city, uh, sometimes even a few blocks from those areas where there should be tall buildings, where we in fact should not see those higher forms. And getting that right takes a tremendous amount of work. It's very challenging to get that right. And we have a very high level city planning document. One of the things I'm moving towards is creating neighborhood plans. Uh, because our neighborhoods are so unique and the context and getting the context specific, specifics right is critical to ensure that we're not killing the golden goose with the growth, of, the growth that we see. So I would say I share the concern that you've outlined, um, and I think it's, a very, it's very, very tricky and challenging to negotiate. With respect to your comment about the scale of the retail, I also share that concern. Um, and there's a tremendous amount of work that needs to be done in this area. As I mentioned at the outset, we don't currently have the regulatory tools. We use the powers of persuasion, but we don't have the regulatory tools to get smaller, the smaller scale footprint. This is an area where we're doing some work because we are quite concerned that we're at risk of losing that finer grain retail throughout the city. And I think it's an incredible risk, not only to the character of the city, but to the walkability of our neighborhoods. Because you tend to get uh, more variety in terms of the uses when you have that smaller scale, and you're more locally, likely to do a variety of trips within walking distance when you have that very local scale. Hello. Hi Jennifer, I really liked your presentation, thank you very much. Bruce Winder from Retail Advisors Network. Um, just had a question for you in terms of the growth of e-commerce and online shopping. 
uh, in retail and you know how that works in terms of potentially more pickup locations being mixed in with some of the uh, urban locations, the transportation to get products bought online to local communities. Just wondering how the City of Toronto is sort of factoring in the, the inevitable growth of, uh, of e-commerce into your plans. Um, so I will not pretend to be an expert in e-commerce. I will say that uh, it's very interesting that when you get the uh, Main Street retail right, that there's a quality of life consideration that drives uh, um, shopping on Main Streets. So for example, you know, Gateway Grocers has been around for 15 years. Um, how many people do that, have your groceries delivered by a truck to your house, right, you know? Speaking to the converted maybe here, but you know, I tried it once, didn't like it. I like to pick up my own tomatoes, thank you very much. Um, and that's an enjoyable part of my everyday life because I walk down my street and I, I you know, I stop at the deli and I stop at the, so I actually, um, I might be the wrong person to ask because I think that it's entirely possible that um, for the types of things we're talking about on main streets, that if we design our main streets right as places for people where you do a whole variety of things, that they will always be more desirable than doing those things online. Interestingly, I think the more abstract our worlds have become through Twitter and email, the more important real places have become. People want to connect, and I was fascinated by this during the Blue Jays playoffs when it was freezing cold outside and I could look outside my office window and Nathan Phillips Square was filled with people who could have most likely been home watching the show, on, watching the game on the TV, but they wanted to be in a public space. They wanted to be together. And I actually think if we design our main streets right, a big part of our main streets is not just about getting the tomato, it's actually about being part of public life. And I think there's an innate drive and desire for that, which is why cities are becoming more and more popular. Great, thank you. Hi, Jennifer. My name is Catherine Porter. I write a column for the Star, but I'm also part of this uh, Danforth East Community Association pop-up project. Great. So I have two questions for you. One is, you didn't talk about gentrification and moving poverty that's moving out from this built area of the city to the suburbs where there is no built form and no services. So I'm interested in what your insights are on that and how to plan without gentrify, plan vibrant uh, streets without driving out poor people. And my second question is, you said that without density, you can't really build a main street. And we've been doing, we've been doing it, now maybe you think that there's density in our neighborhood, but we've been doing that successfully, I'd say, on the Danforth and the more of a part of the Danforth. I'm interested in your thoughts on agency. Like, so some of this is just in your office, in terms of planning density, but if people are living in the neighborhoods and they want to help create main streets or places that they can walk. Is there other, are there other ideas in your travels that you've come across in terms of building it from communities, what we can do to, to affect change on our streets? Mm -hmm. Great, so um, two, two things. The first thing with respect to gentrification, um, I do think there's a certain amount of inevitability around gentrification that is impossible to regulate or control as long as you have a market-based system. Uh, one of the ways that New York City managed gentrification in the 60s and 70s, and we tend to under, or really in the 80s, we tend to underestimate the success of New York City is still directly linked to this, which was strong public policy. Artists were given below market uh, rent that they still have in Soho District, in the, um, uh, you know, right in the heart of Manhattan. There's a lot of artists, and part of why Manhattan is so interesting is because there's a lot of artists. Strong public policy was what did that. So there's a policy role. I think it's challenging in our environment because so much of our housing has in fact been owned. Uh, on the flip side, there's things that we can do and we are doing in the redevelopment of specific areas in order to ensure that we are creating a real mix of housing types. So this doesn't respond quite as much to the gentrification, but Regent Park is a perfect example. Regent Park is about uh, fundamental densification, revisioning, and reinvestment in a community while protecting the social housing that exists there today. 
So there are some things that we've done. St. Lawrence neighborhood is probably one of our best examples, but many of the policy mechanisms that existed at the federal level that allowed St. Lawrence neighborhood to be developed as co-ops, a lot of those policies no longer exist. So there's a very strong public policy role in preventing gentrification. Right now, we pretty much have a market-based system, and in a market-based system, you will absolutely see poverty-driven to less dire, you know, people-driven uh, who can't afford to be in areas that are gentrifying to less desirable areas. Uh, the other question that you asked around Leslieville, um, I have a couple of responses to that. One is that we have all different levels of density in this city. Uh, our suburbs vary in their densities. And when you get to that tipping point when the main street becomes viable, varies as well, depending on the disposable income of the community. So in a community with a higher disposable income, you'll see that it might be able to support more of that main street retail earlier than a community with a lower disposable income. You'll see restaurants and shops that will be supported on that main street simply because there's a higher disposable income. So I don't want to suggest that there's like there's a formula, and when you hit this density target, then suddenly you're going to have vibrant Main Street retail. It's also important to note that when we talk about vibrant Main Street retail, we're actually talking about a lot of different things. Because different streets in our city, which we would probably mostly agree on are all Main Streets, have very different characters. Some are more high-end, some are, uh, are, are not as expensive. So in part, it depends on a lot of different nuances and variables that come together to create the mix. And this is one of the reasons why neighborhood-based approaches and responses are so critical, because you really have to respond to the local nuances. And I would suggest your community is probably higher density um, than, you know, there's more density there than some of the places I've been in my mind referring to that are very uh, low density. Um, I can think about your question about getting more involved um, and what we can do in our office to play a more um, uh, a more proactive role with communities. I'll have to think about that question, but it's, I think it's a good one. Thank you. I'll, I'll take two more questions. Uh, my name's Anne, and thank you for bringing up the example about how you had a conversation with the developer and were able to educate and shift the, the focus of that, so that was really neat. I'm wondering if there is any relationship between the city and already established um, owners of strip malls or larger complexes, and if they're, you know, what that looks like, because I'm finding, I'm looking for space right now, and between speaking with the leasing manager, uh, their hands are kind of tied based on what the owner of the building wants, and when you have that disconnect, um, I find people are maybe shying away from new ideas that would encourage a lot of the local economic development that we've been talking about and how important the main streets are. So the most formalized relationship that we have is with BIAs, and we have BIAs across the entire city. Um, but there isn't, um, there isn't any kind of blanket approach to strip malls in a formalized relationship. They're a landowner with, with land. Um, we don't actually have a relationship other than in unique circumstances. So for example, we're working very closely in our tower communities in the suburbs around how we can integrate a variety of new uses into our tower neighborhoods, particularly in our neighborhood improvement areas. And in those instances, we've established partnerships and relationships with the landowners. Uh, it's a real tension in a really quickly growing and changing city. 15 years ago, I started a company in the city as an entrepreneur, and I was in an old, drafty warehouse space where the rent was cheap. I was just outside of the downtown uh, in King Spadina, and that building is now a condo. Well, uh, I then moved into another drafty old warehouse space that I was in for another five years. That building is now a condo. So one of the risks that we do have in the city is that a lot of the Class B office space, most of which can be accommodated on Main Streets, um, is in fact disappearing. And it makes the importance of integrating that office on Main Streets even more, even more critical. Um, I would suggest you contact the Economic Development Office at the City of Toronto, because they might be able to help you more specifically. Hello. Hello, my name is Ray. Um, very love. Um, I had a question about, have we looked in examined how 
um, basically how self-segregation has influenced communities. For instance, we live in a vibrant community right here in the village that it wasn't a miracle of city planning, it was a history of self-segregation. Um, I'm originally, I've lived in Toronto for 10 years, originally from Chicago. Chicago is a neighborhood-defined city with very low city planning, but self-segregation, the neighborhood I grew up in, single family homes, a main street archer, we had like roller rings, local pizzerias, this was not even a city planning, but how that has influenced, so it has more of a diversity, Chicago seems to be have the diversity that Toronto has, whereas New York seems to have all density. And if we look in that, well, I would suggest that um, a lot, a lot less of what you're calling self segregation is actually self segregation than it is a whole variety of policies that actually drive people into certain places. Um, and the, uh, you know, there's a whole racialized analysis of historic zoning policies and particularly a lot of research that's been done in the states um, of the implications of zoning policy. And I think the whole objective of what we're trying to do here in the city of Toronto in creating complete communities is by providing a whole variety of choices in every neighborhood. So in every neighborhood, there's a variety of housing types. You're not just going to get single family homes in a neighborhood, you're going to get, you're also going to have lofts and you're going to have walk-ups and you're going to have a variety of different typologies as well as ownership and rental in one neighborhood. Uh, that is about beginning to allow for more diversity in neighborhoods. And it uh, there'll be a certain amount of self-segregation, use that language, but the extent to which we can use in our planning frameworks, um, we can provide more choice in every neighborhood is about uh, allowing for there to be more diversity in every neighborhood. And I think that's actually what you get in New York City. You have a lot of diversity in different neighborhoods. Um, but you also still have the historic, you know, there's you know, the Jewish quarter and there's the Italian quarter. And that's, uh, I actually don't see that as a negative thing either. I think that's uh, it's human nature for people who want to be around people who eat the same food and speak the same language. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. Yeah. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.